Hey everybody, this is Mad Panda Games here, and today we're going to be tackling another part of Gehenna. So let's get started, guys. Now I think it's this one. There it is, yep. Hills of golden grass swaying in the breeze spread out before you, the horizon bright and welcoming. The vast dunes and limestone formations of the distant badlands look like a mirage, swaying and blistering in the heat. Alibaba immediately bounds away from your group as soon as he is out of the gates speeding through the open grass and whooping in unbridled delight. He's quite graceful, though you can't help but laugh at his childlike joy. You're tempted to join in. You stand next to Vali, who's also stopped to laugh at Alibaba's behavior. Okay. Oh wait, nope. It accidentally went- hold on, let me go back a second. There. Is this the first time he's left the city? Actually, no. He just hasn't seen the outside of the city in a long time. He's always like this. He's cut off by Alibaba circling around near you to yell at you to join him, even though he doesn't stop running long enough for you to reply. Azizi hisses softly at Alibaba and Vali rubs the palm of his hand over her snout to calm her. He'll tire himself out eventually. I say let him enjoy the moment. I'm enjoying this time away from the palace myself. You turn away from Vali, admiring the vast wilderness stretching out before you. The cry of a behemoth echoes through the flatlands, and a rush of birds spring up to fly away from the roar. Everyone seems more free outside the borders of the city. Anka and Noir walk next to one another, speaking in quiet murmurs. Alibaba circles around them before taking off again, waving to you and Valdi as he passes by. Let's, uh, let's go, let's save first. Let us save. Let us save. Yeah. And let's go with Noor and Anka, because I think I'm romancing her. Let's go for it. You pick up your pace and walk beside Noor and Anka. I never thanked you for the flowers you placed in my room. Are they from your garden? I've always had an interest in gardening, since my time in Livius. Ifrita doesn't really care for such things, but she allows us as long as it doesn't interfere with her own desires. That's kind of nice. Noor clasps her hands together, deep in thought. Anka leans closer in interest. I was born within the mountains of Livius, where the suns don't shine as strongly as they do in Davamond. Our summers are short and our winters are long and lightless. But when the suns did shine during the warm months, the land would come alive with vegetation, blanketing every hill and cliff the eye can see. The sight is breathtaking. Oh, she's like smiling. She's happy for once. Initially, I came to the Imperial City to learn about the flora of the Empire. This kingdom has an array of flowers and cacti now like no other place in Gehenna. Even so, I miss Livius. It is still home to me. Aww. Anka senses her melancholy and brushes her hand across the generals in a silent, comforting gesture. Tell me more about Livius, please. What is it like there? Not many would call Livius beautiful, as it's known for its cold mountains. But we have grassy steppes with vibrant life and the mountains aren't as bleak as people imagine. Oh, that's nice, stand up for your home, even though you haven't been there in a long time. I would love to visit and experience it all. I imagine Aurora Borealis must be quite common that far north. They are common, but not easy to find. You would have to be taken by someone who knows where to go, like Moor. Then perhaps you can take us there one day. Oh ho ho. I sense a plan for the future with these two and me, probably. Nora's face turns a deep red at Anka's words. Oh, she's blushing. She's blushing. I love this so much. Sympathetic to Nora's blushing, you change the topic to ask Anka a question that had been on your mind. Anka, I didn't have the chance to hear your petition. What happened? Anka looks away, as if reluctant to respond, her lips pursing as she sighs. It didn't go well. The Empress wouldn't even speak to me. She hardly even acknowledged my presence. Eventually I left to return to the Silver Quarter. My luck wasn't all bad, though. I met Dr. Salam along the way. She met Salam? She's a very interesting woman. I think one day I would like to visit Earth as well. You must be very special, Panda. Ifrita brought you to her specifically to hear your petition, and made a point of making you swear allegiance to her. A trail of confusion runs up in you remembering the discrepancy of who the Empress had been in court versus your room. Noor notices your change in demeanor and places a gloved hand on your arm. Her touch drags you back to reality, grounding you in the present. There is no point in holding onto the past if it hurts you so, Panda. 
Even as you travel further away from the city, you can't help but feel like Ifrita's gaze is still centered on you. Man, what does she want with us? Why are we, out of all the people and all the people who do so much stuff for her and her champions, why are we the most important for this quest right now? Questions that need answering immediately. Despite Noor's words, you mull on your thoughts and almost miss the smell of the stables until you've reached the door. You reach a large grassy paddock, stretches... You reach a large grassy paddock... Okay, I was saying it right. It's just a little grammatical error. You reach a large grassy paddock stretches out before the horizon, where the sand meets the grasslands. The gated area provides plenty of space for the city's mounts to roam around, though you doubt those wooden gates would be effective at keeping the beast of the Badlands at bay. Noor knocks on the old wooden door to the stable, announcing her presence before entering. Good for you. The building looks as though it has fallen and been, been, been rebuilt countless times. The scars of the years have been carved permanently into the aged wood. I know the stable owners well, and they let me come and go as I wish. Noor's eyes fall on the Simurg, who is digging her beak into Vali's robes to search for treats. Wait here. There is no need to frighten the other animals. Yeah. When she returns, she's accompanied by a great pegasus. Ooh! Beautiful! Beautiful! The Pegasus and her, oh, this is a beautiful artwork. I love it immediately. I don't even want to read. I just want to look at this. I'm going to save this just so I can look at it. Just so I can look at it. Okay? It's beautiful. Okay, okay. I'm good. Fangirling over. I'll read again. The Pegasus rubs her muzzle against Nor's hand affectionately, which Nor returns with soft strokes. Nor catches your eye and nods at you in an invitation to approach them. You walk up to the Pegasus with reverence, feeling a sense of awe wash through you at the animal. You run your hand against the Pegasus' feathers, which slip through your fingertips like strands of silk. Oh, we get to pet a Pegasus! This is so awesome! The animal accepts your petting with a serenity, and you're awed by the creature once again. Beautiful! How shall we divide the riders? I'll go with Anka on Azizi. The sight of a Lota on a horse might be a bit too much. I don't mind going with whoever has room. Um. Ride with Noor. I'm romancing her. I'll stay new with Noor. Noor hosts herself up in the saddle before reaching out her hand to you. We will cover more land if we take to the skies. You place your foot into the stirrups and grasp the general's hand pulling yourself up and over until you're sitting comfortably in the saddle. You watch Alibaba and Valiru climb into the Simurg, Anka taking Azizi's reins in hand. Alibaba happily wraps his arms around Anka's waist and Vali sighs before begrudgingly holding onto Alibaba. <laughs> I bet he was the one who was holding onto the princess, but he got there too late, dude. You wonder for a moment if the Simurg can support the combined weight of a Nijid, a Ridam, and a Lota but your doubts immediately vanquish as the Samir bolts up into the air, climbing with incredible speed. Azizi circles twice before she flies through the clouds and out of sight, following the river downstream. You cautiously wrap your arms around Noor's waist as the horse stomps and shuffs, Noor hushing it and gently guiding it with the reins. Hold on. You tighten your grasp as Noor kicks her horse to a canter, breathing in sharply as the wind whips sand against your face. Because... Core. Before you can even exhale, the mare is at a full gallop. Her wings beat wildly as she picks up speed and climbs into the air. You glide further and further into the sky, the accent making your ears pop. The flight begins to stabilize as the Pegasus flies into an air current, gliding past farmland and pastures. The people and buildings below you look like tiny specks upon the land. The river below is a deep turquoise, flowing steadily through the grasslands. You wrap your arms tight around Noir's waist, breathing in the fresh air and admiring all the wide open space. Azizi races past you, the sound of Alibaba's whoops ringing through the air as they shoot past like a bolt of lightning. Noir nudges her horse, who snorts and beats her rings rapidly, her legs kicking up into an airborne gallop. As you pick up speed, you insignificantly dig your claws into Noir's tunic. Noir frees a hand from the reins, clutching your wrists and squeezing slightly. I won't let you fall. You can trust me. Oh, she's smiling again. Maybe she likes us. You press your cheek against her back, breathing in her scent. A mixture of roses and tempered leather. 
Her words calm your frayed nerves, and you loosen your grip. Cool, and now it's nightfall. You fly for what feels like hours, the exhaustion of the day beginning to catch up with you. While you have a little way to go before you reach the desolate expanses of the Badlands, the outskirts begin to feel wild and untamed. Noor tenses her knees around her horse and clicks her tongue, guiding her mare towards a slow descent. Your landing is just as graceful as your takeoff, the red pegasus folding her wings as her gallop slows to a trot. You are eager to get your feet back on solid land as the soreness of travel begins to creep up on you, your thighs and back sore and tight. You drink fully from the flask at Noor's side, the cool water refreshing you enough to keep some of the exhaustion at bay. You begin to search for a good place to set the campfire, and find an area of trampled grass. An absolutely massive creature left this mark, and you hope it's no longer near. Nonetheless, the tall grasses would provide good cover for the night, and the flattened area the ideal place to make camp. Anka brushes down both mounts with a practiced ease, singing softly in a gentle tone. Noor stands a short distance away, her eyes lidded slightly as she watches Anka run a gentle hand over the pegasus. Vali and Alibaba collect rocks and brush to create a fire pit. Just as the twin suns begin setting down over the horizon, Vali sparks a flame over the pit with a flick of his hand. Man, I wish I could do that. Just BAM. Fire everywhere. But like a controlled fire so that people aren't injured. Because fire safety kids is the best lesson you could learn. As well as stranger danger. Well, actually there's a lot of good lessons everyone can learn, so don't quote me. The temperature drops the moment the suns fall behind the horizon, casting the land in long shadows. The twin moons, Mithra and Mohana, previously overwhelmed by the sun's light, start to shine more brightly as they take over the night sky, lighting your camp with pale light. Everyone gathers around the warmth from the now blazing fire. You shiver and instinctually huddle closer to the flame. Alibaba and Vali begin preparing a dinner of hearty stew. The smell of homely spices wafts to your nostrils, briefly reminding you of Salam's delicious cooking. Aw, I miss Salam, she was awesome. Alibaba serves you a meal before moving on to everyone else. Your stomach rumbles painfully and you wolf down your food. Satisfied and tired, everyone sits back to enjoy the cool night air. Noor sits cross-legged beside her dozing mare, both of them sitting next to Azizi who appears to have made friends with the Pegasus during their time with Anka. Anka rests her back against her Simurg, sighing contentedly as she listens to Alibaba and Vali chatter with one another, Vali's loud laughter echoing in the dark. Should we tell each other stories? Isn't that what you're meant to do when you're camping in a group? Hmm, I likely have a tale or two I could share. Sure, I'd love that. Okay. Hmm. I wonder if the story's gonna be any good. Maybe. Maybe not. Something's in his eyes are shifty. Valiru scratches his beard for a moment, contemplating which story to tell. Well, the story of the first time I fought a saber cat is certainly a memorable one. This was long before I ever became Ifrita's apostle. I was summoned to Ifrita's court, and I hadn't the slightest clue what I was getting myself into, stepping into her palace. She demanded I prove that the stories of my magical exploits were true, and place me in the arena to fight with just my magic and my claws. I was only a young boy then, barely sprouting my first beard, and I was absolutely terrified of what would come next. I stood there, quaking in my boots as the iron gates rose up before me, the rattle and clank of chains shaking the ground. I distinctly remember the low, spine-chilling sound of an angry growl. I'd never seen a saber cat in my entire life, this beast was massive, as tall as me, and with sharp fangs bigger than my hand. This seems dangerous. It snarled at me, hungry and furious, glaring at me like the hunk of defenseless meat I was. The cat pounced on me. Okay. From this point forward in the game, all choices that may contain triggering content will be written in red font. You will not miss out on major story content by choosing to skip a triggering choice. Let's listen to the story. Its claws dug into me as I summoned a torrent of flame. The saber cat jumped back, the smell of burning fur filling the arena. I readied myself for another attack, and the cat circled me, pouncing and digging those horrible teeth into my arm. I used every ounce of strength within me to fend the beast off, to stop it from pinning me down and dealing me a final blow. I pulled fire into my hands, clawing at any patch of skin I could find as the cat clenched its teeth deeper into me. I thought I was done for with how much I bled onto the floor. I punched at the cat's face one last time, 
more in spite than in any genuine effort. It yanked itself backwards, roaring in agony. The cat's teeth broke off in my arm, and that's when I took my chance. I tore the tooth from my arm and stabbed the cat, over and over again. Pain was beyond my train of thought. I had a sort of tunnel vision, angry and terrified. I couldn't see in front of me. I could only lash out. After that, everything started to get hazy, dark. I don't remember falling unconscious from shock. When I woke up, I was in the infirmary and in quite a bit of pain, but alive and victorious. Anka has curled up closer to Noir during Volley's stories, their hands clasped together between their bodies. Alibaba lay sprawled out on the ground, snoring lightly from behind the mask still set on his face. That is enough storytelling for tonight. Tomorrow night, perhaps I would like to tell one. I'd love to hear one of your stories, Noir. Noir smiles softly and nudges Anka, who yawns and stretches. Yes, let's get some rest. Sleep well, everyone. She curls back up against Azizi, the Simurk shifting to place a wing on top of her as a blanket. Fali stands to lay a, blanc- a blanket on Alibaba, before murmuring a good night to you as he lies down on his own bedroll. You close your eyes, falling immediately into a deep sleep. Hmm. Okay. Whoa. What's happening here? Is this a dream? When you open your eyes, your body is floating in water. The formations around you stretch and reach up to the sky as a single strange light shines directly upon you. A tide rushes up and you rock in the waves but stay in place. The light above you feels like it's buzzing, pulsing slightly with the effort. The ringing grows louder and louder until you feel as though your bones are vibrating with the sound. An understanding falls over you, and you realize that the sound is a voice. You know this language. It sounds familiar enough that you can almost understand the words, but the voice speaks too quickly for you to make them out. A voice that's both angelic and eldritch, reaching out out from the void and speaking to you. You can no longer resist the call. It's as if your very sense of self was dependent on knowing the lyrics to this cosmic song. This does not sound good. You push against your paralysis, dragging out an arm from the water to hold out to the sky, desperately trying to find a way to touch the light. You remain frozen and a panic spike of fear races through you at the thought of drowning. You open your mouth to call out in a screech of desperation. You bolt up with a start, gasping as a cold sweat running down your back. You hear Noor and Anka's whisperings, followed by approaching footfalls. Anka sits down next to you and places a hand on your brow in comfort. You sigh in relief, holding onto her wrist to ground yourself. Did I... was I screaming? Yes, but it's okay. You're okay. Did you have a nightmare? You weren't sure what to call what you had seen. You shift uncomfortably, the confusion and fear of the dream still pounding in your chest. You're not certain that you can put what you were feeling into words just yet. Anka gives you a sympathetic look and you hear the shuffles of the others from behind her. Noor walks over to you, holding a cup in her hand. This must be the sleeping draught that she had told you about earlier. You take the cup from her gratefully, drinking the draught in a single gulp. The mixture is sweet and you immediately feel a sense of calm fall over you. Your heart stops racing and sleepiness starts to fog your mind. Maybe it would help if you slept closer to someone else? You wouldn't feel as if you're all alone then. You look around at the others in the dim campfire light. Fali is sitting upright with a small flame floating next to him, rubbing sleep from his eyes. Alibaba hasn't moved from where he lies on the ground, but you can see the reflection of the campfire in his glowing eyes as he peeks out from under his blanket. Okay. Well, I am definitely going to sleep next to Nora and Anka, but first I must save. In return. Yes. It would make the most sense for you to sleep next to the largest group, you think. The fact that it included two giant beasts for protection helped. Oh, and not the fact that there's two beautiful ladies there. That's not, that's not an issue? That's not, like, something you took into consideration? I think not. Is it alright if I sleep near you and Noir? Aw, Anka approves! Yay! Of course, Panda. I'd be happy to have you with us. It's bold of you, but you carry your bedroll and set it down in the space that had been left between where Noor and Anka had been resting. Noor and Anka follow behind you. Neither of them say anything about the sleeping arrangement. Here, may you have easier dreams, Panda. Noor pulls her fur shawl over the three of you. Your bodies aren't close enough to be touching but there's a warmth from both of their presidents that eases the anxiety from your dream. Anka mumbles a quiet goodnight at you, 
Noir scent is entwined within her fur shawl, and it wraps around you to envelop you in comforting softness. The soft sound of breathing lulls you into closing your eyes. You sleep. Okay. Oh. This isn't good. You open your eyes and realize that you've returned to the same dream place. Except this time something is different. You no longer feel afraid, the lapping waves soothing you. Azam! Azam! Look what I found! A clear, childish voice rings out, echoing across the rock formations. The voice reverates around you, your surroundings fading with the sound. Grass springs up around you and your vision is obscured by the tall blades. You hear footfalls fast near you and you hold your breath, wondering if you'll be seen. Let me see. The voice is more mature, gentle, and somehow familiar. The child responds to his arm with a giggling shout, voice cracking in excitement. It's a worm! It's huge! Can I take it home? Habiti, what did I say about bugs? To leave them alone. And why do we leave them alone? Because they have feelings and families and they're just like us. Oh, that's a, that's a good life lesson, kids. Azam laughs, an unbearably sweet sound that fills up your heart to overflowing. Exactly. I'm so proud you remembered. Tall grass shifts as you hear the child whisper farewell to the worm. I think it's time that we turn to our family, too. Ah, but I don't want to go home. I want to stay out here. Azam laughs again, her voice full of mirth. But we have to go home. Maman and Baba are waiting for us. Waiting for you. But... I don't wanna. I wanna stay out here with you. Azam's voice grows quiet, tender and full of warmth. I won't leave you, Habiti. Fine. Will you carry me? Of course, Ifrita. I will always carry you home. Oh. Oh. Huh. Huh. Ifrita. Why are we dreaming about her memories? Oh, and this, that's the end. That's the end, I guess. Okay. So, thanks for playing Gehenna. So, I'm going to save. Okay, I'll save. And then, I guess. Oh, wait, no, I have to go back. My bad. Okay, I saved that. So, I guess once Chapter 3 comes out, then it'll be even cooler. Because now we have a big plot twist. We're dreaming about Ifrita's memories. Why? Is she doing this? Is this why she's contacted us? So many questions. And I won't be able to figure it out till the next chapter is released. So that sucks. But at least we figured out that Noor has a freaking awesome Pegasus. And all animals are lovely in here. Like the worms, they have families and friends and lives. Moral of the story, kids. Don't hurt animals. And with that, I think I'll sign out. So this is Mad Panda signing out. If you like my content and you want to see more content like this, please remember to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that bell for notifications. Once again, this is Mad Panda signing out. See you later, guys.